women are starting 1,200 countries, uh, countries, companies every single day. Unfortunately, those companies are going to grow up to be runts. Women are undernourishing their businesses. Money is a key ingredient, and um, women are starting and growing their businesses with less. Um, as a result, women are one-third as likely as men to have million-dollar companies. Um, why should you care? Well, um, why should you care? Um, it's not just a feminist issue. If half the population isn't working at full capacity, we're not innovating, we're not creating jobs, and we're not adding to prosperity. So um, you've read the predictions about crowdfunding. All of you feel that um, it's leveling the playing field. The reality is it's not. So I've teamed with Crowdnetic um, to analyze the first year's data on equity crowdfunding, and women are not seeking, women entrepreneurs are not seeking capital at the same rate as they are among uh, um, traditional angel investors. So 17% of all uh, um, uh, deals being sought through equity crowdfunding are from women entrepreneurs, and uh, among angel inv investors, it's 23%. So um, I've put together a panel because uh, we're going to change that. So um, I'm, rather than doing introductions of each person, I'm going to tell you why I've specifically chosen each woman on the panel um, to speak. So Amanda Brown, um, as you've heard, is with uh, the National Women's Business Council. They've undertaken um, research uh, that uh, confirms the underfunding of women entrepreneurs, and she's going to talk about that research and also about what the federal government is going to be doing uh, over the next uh, few years. Um, we also have Terry Reiser uh, from Tag Creative. Uh, it may seem strange to have a marketer up on the panel uh, talking about crowdfunding. Um, I am a marketer, and I believe that it's a marketing issue. So Terry's going to talk about best practices from uh, consumer marketers and how it applies to activating women as entrepreneurs and women as uh, angel investors. Uh, Deborah Jackson uh, is here. She's with Plum Alley. And um, Deborah is going to talk about the lessons learned from rewards-based crowdfunding and how it applies to equity crowdfunding. Uh, Joanna Schwartz of Early Shares is an equity-based uh, crowdfunding platform, and um, she's going to talk about how um, equity platforms can appeal to women as both uh, entrepreneurs and angel investors. So Amanda, if you would talk a little bit about the research and uh, what the federal government is doing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm already the problem child. Um, was running late, so glad that I could, could make it. Um, so a little bit about the council, just for some context. We are a research entity, and our kind of mission in life is to be the government's independent voice on issues of impact and importance um, to women business owners, entrepreneurs, and women business leaders. We report annually to the White House, the President, and the Small Business Administration on ways that we can actually better the climate, which is obviously grounded in the research that we are doing. So our work is kind of focused around the what we like to call four pillars. They are access to capital, it is job creation and growth, it is access to markets, and then the fourth one being the uh, foundation of our work, which is data collection. We were formed back in 1988 uh, by Congress um, in response to the fact that when women wanted to get a loan, they needed a male relative to co-sign that loan. So they um, established, one, the Office of Women Business Ownership at the Small Business Administration to kind of help combat and identify by problems unique to women, and they also form the National Women's Business Council. So it's uh, an unfortunate situation where access to capital has been the number one priority of the council every single year, and it is because all of the research confirms time and time again that it is a obviously a great barrier for all entrepreneurs, but it is a uniquely great barrier for, for women. We actually just put out a new research study um, where the, the line of... Um, for the press release was like, it is a greater with the ER in parentheses challenge for women, because it really is. So 
we have done round table after round table. Um, we have done a lot of research on this topic and time and time again do hear the challenges that women are facing with access to capital. So we do um, a ton of work to make sure that we are talking to the right players to, to figure out ways that we can improve that. So just for some stats, because uh, I think that is always helpful and numbers are always key and I am a data nerd myself. Um, so on average, women are have received only 2% of total funding from outside equity. Among the most successful firms, men started their businesses with six times as much capital as women did. On average, men start their businesses with nearly twice as much capital as women. We're talking $135,000 versus $75,000 for women. And if you're looking particularly at the high growth firms, men are starting their businesses with the six times as much capital. So obviously this remains one of the most significant barriers. We have been uh, talking about this at length on the council and actually just did a, our public meeting in June was focused around this issue where we address the innovative strategies um, for women to, to think about capital, which I think leads to the crowdfunding conversation um, and opens up the door for a, a lot of, there's a lot of interest right now. And I do think that crowdfunding is a unique, uh, we like to call it a game changer for women in particular, just because it is obviously we're being shut out from the kind of more traditional routes of uh, a funding. It's hard to get angel money. It's hard to get VC money. Um, crowdfunding is just a really great opportunity, and I think for women um, in particular. So we uh, actually had somebody from um, Jane Applegate from Plum Alley on to talk about how uh, women can and should start thinking about crowdfunding just as a way to, you know, build some kind of popularity for their business interest, demand, and actually get the money that they need to get started. Uh, that has then kind of spurred a longer conversation within the council on the interest and kind of research topics that we'll be looking into in the future, which are focused around undercapitalization. So like you were saying, Jerry, women are starting their businesses and it's, you know, we have found in the research that it's easier to get that 10 or 20K small business loan to get started, but once you you, you know, get six months later when you need to build that extra kitchen for your restaurant or something like that, and you don't have the funding, your business is tanking. Um, and so because of this undercapitalization issue being a, what we, you know, hypothesize as a contributing factor to failure, we will be taking on that as one of our research topics for this coming year. The research actually just started, so hopefully um, we will be able to kind of address and work with the policy players at the federal funding level um, to to address that with some actual congressional legislation on that. Um, I do think that as we, uh, as, as we look to do, to do more and kind of support more women business owners, um, we will be particularly interested in crowdfunding and have been having uh, more and more conversations about what we can do from the council side and what we can do with, with an SBA and what we can work with the White House to do and Congress to do to make sure that they are supporting the crowdfunding movement as well. So in our coming actual annual report, you'll see some recommendations upon what uh, the regulations around crowdfunding we will be uh, taking on to make sure that this actually the store stays open for women business owners um, and I, I think we are you know I'm really excited to be here today just because I think that crowdfunding is you know such a tremendous opportunity and presents uh, you know the the doors are just really open for women business owners in particular when we're talking about crowdfunding so I can stop there and that okay great great so <laughs> she is passionate um, <laughs> Many of you represent crowdfunding uh, platforms and you want to tr attract women as entrepreneurs and women as investors to your platform. So I've asked Terry to be um, on the panel because uh, in my opinion, it's marketing. So the rules of the road that apply to consumer, uh, to women as consumers, I think also apply to women as entrepreneurs and women as investors. So if you can talk a little bit about the best practices. I'd love to. Tag Creative has been in business for 14 years and I'm proud to say we are 100% women owned and women certified. And um, 
we are women, obviously, and we know women, and in today's marketplace where women, um, it's acknowledged, are making so many of the decisions, we think that understanding how to connect with them is critically important, and how to keep the conversation going is really important. We specialize in marketing to women and in creating emotional connections that are more than just information, and that as Jason was talking about earlier, really keep the target audience coming back for more. I think when we talk about marketing to women, we're really talking about relationship building and uh, relationship building as a totally holistic experience. Uh, the success being when you're going to market to women, you really need to not just know what they want in terms of your product, but you really need to understand their whole life, and you really need to market to their whole life. Uh, I think as women, and I know this is not just gender you know, specific, we're all time challenged these days. We're all multitasking. And so a really important first like lesson or best practice is to respect our time or the lack of it and not to waste our time to understand that what we really want and really need is clear concise communication so that we can easily understand like a call to action easily like evaluate the pros and cons the benefits the risks the value of any kind of proposition financial you know cosmetic uh, educational it doesn't make a difference um, you know, we're seeking authenticity like the millennial generation, even the older of us are, and interactions with brands and products that is, they're really built on uh, trust and straight talk. So how do we get there? Uh, you know, it's really about engagement, and engagement and starting any conversation, a good conversation, is all about listening and really listening, not assuming and... Uh, not, um, I guess, projecting is what I want to say. Um, we really, uh, we want to be heard. We want our wants and needs to be taken seriously. You know, marketing, I'm sure you all have marketing departments, you know, the rules of marketing. You need to clearly communicate your reason to believe, your point of difference in the marketplace, and also your benefits. But especially for women, you have to consider the importance of the creative and visual expression of your brand because that's really how you're going to get across the context of who you are and what you mean to your audience and what you can offer them. And it's a really powerful tool that is like often overlooked and especially in sectors where there's so much information and, and many complicated uh, layers to communicate. Um, if you can make that communication in a way that is memorable and also appealing, uh, you're going to connect on a level that's emotional and not just informational, and that's going to put you like light years ahead of your competitors. The other thing in terms of emotional connections, I think it's important, uh, especially with women, that you don't just understand the positive side of what's going to push their buttons, what are they really going to go for, but you understand their fears and their challenges, the perceptions they're trying to overcome, uh, their the stereotypes, their... Um, like lack of education in some areas, and you want to be especially careful not to condescend, not use condescending language, not to talk down to us. Uh, like, we want you to talk with us, not to us and uh, not at us. And along with all that is like, don't dumb it down for us. We really can get it. We want to understand and we can understand very complex situations and propositions. We value education and uh, ultimately we want to just be marketed to as intelligent beings. Um, I guess in terms of that I would say that another powerful tool in marketing to women is the use of testimonials. Um, I know there's a lot of conversation about women in community but we do respect and um, validate the experiences and learnings of other women and so testimonials are a really strong way to get through to your audience too. So, Terry, if you can uh, wrap okay, up. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I knew I would get going on this. Uh, <laughs> I would say the most important things are, like, really understand your target audience, really know where she is and which touch points resonate with her uh, the most. And especially in the financial sector, don't, like, underestimate the power of the visual representation of your brand because it's a big 
point of difference for you in the market, and it will keep your customer engaged and coming back for more. Thank you. So I'm going to add just two more things to what Terry said, um, and that storytelling is really important, not just the testimonials. And women um, will pay for convenience and time saving. So I think that's an important point for the crowdfunding uh, platforms. Um, I want to turn it over to Deborah Jackson, who's going to talk about uh, the lessons learned um, in the rewards-based crowdfunding arena and how it applies to equity. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm delighted to be here because I come from Wall Street. I spent 21 years on Wall Street. I started at Goldman Sachs in 1980. So it's absolutely fabulous to be around my sector um, because now I have a crowdfunding platform and I tend to speak at conferences with 20 to 30 year olds and a lot of people wearing hoodies and in the tech field. So it's really good to see all of you in business suits. So um, yeah, so I, I come from Wall Street. I spent um, 20 years raising money for companies and my last stop was in healthcare technology. So I really fell in love with technology. I knew I would never be a developer or coder, but I saw the power of technology. So after I retired from Wall Street, I became a very active angel investor. I have a portfolio of early stage companies that I am watching. Some are underwater, some are doing great, so let's stay tuned to that. Um, and I also was uh, uh, invested in the Golden Seeds Fund. And so I, I, I come at this whole thing from having been on Wall Street, knowing how to raise money for companies, and also loving technology. And so when I retired from Wall Street, I realized that there were huge, huge opportunities with female-founded companies, that there were great companies. They tended to be undercapitalized. I saw it as a very important, big marketing and investing opportunity. And so I decided I wanted to do, do more in that sector. So I founded a company about three years ago. It's called Plum Alley. We started off with e-commerce for female-founded companies, and we were all about profiling these fabulous companies and getting more sales, because in th at the end of the day, what matters, sales and companies. And so we, we had that platform. We profiled over 100 fabulous female-founded companies. And what kept coming up is they kept saying, you know, I need more capital. I need money to do this or to do that. And I thought, well, I watched the, like we all did, the Obama campaign. And you would see all those college kids gave $5 and all that money added up to a huge war chest. And I thought, with the power of technology and these great companies, it'd be wonderful to have a platform that really focused on those great companies and giving them opportunities. So our company was founded. We've um, been in business for a couple years. We, as of today, we are releasing our version 2.0, which is a very, it's, it's a serious tech product. It really teaches you everything you need to know about running a successful campaign. On our site, our campaigns have been over 80% successful. On Kickstarter, they tend to be 40, Indiegogo, it's in the 20s. So, you know, we're all about success. If you launch a campaign, we want it to be successful. And there are specific things that you can do to increase your chances of success. So we've lived with our platform. We've had all these different campaigns come forward, a huge number of entrepreneurs that have test marketed products, gotten pre-orders before they went into production. Um, so we've, we've kind of lived with this over the past year. And what I will tell you is a couple of observations. Number one, crowdfunding, on a reward basis is now part of the capital chain. People used to think of it as some activity happening over here, mostly skewed a younger demographic. That is not the case. There are campaigns starting every day by women in their 40s and 50s and for all types of products, for companies, for art projects. So it's not this sort of over there segment. And when you think about it, women are 50% or more of the population. So this is not a niche market. This is actually big business. And so the, um, the campaigns, one of the things that we've learned is this is part of the capital chain now. And so many companies that come and do a successful campaign move on and then go to angel funding or VC funding. And so, um, and it's very commonplace now to um, be with VCs. I speak frequently on panels with venture capitalists and angel investors, where the VCs will say to a company, well, gee, did you do a campaign? Did you do a crowdfunding campaign? And 
I think that's really critical because what's happening is these sectors are not competing. They're actually working in conjunction with one another. And the skills that you need to run a successful crowdfunding campaign are exactly the skills that you need to raise angel and VC money. Same kind of thing. You have to stand up there, communicate what you're doing, ask people for money. So, um, so it's you know an accepted practice. It's part of the capital chain. And again, I come at it from Wall Street, and I and I and I know there's crowdfunding, there's angel, there's VC, there's you know public markets, there's private equity. So it's it's a place on the capital chain. Um, next observation, uh, which has been documented with research that's come out this summer, is that it breaks down by gender. No surprise. What happens is people tend to promote projects or, or launch projects that are consistent with their interests. So on Kickstarter, huge number of projects, what I call kind of blow them up, beat them up mobile games. You know, happy they're out there. There's a huge demographic that supports that. But that's not probably what women are going to like and gravitate to. So there's a whole segment of other types of projects that um, are out there. and it, the, the data shows there were two big studies that came out in the past year. One was done by NYU and the Wharton School that looked at gender in crowdfunding campaigns. And they did this kind of lab experiment where they put up fake projects and then they called in men and women and they just changed the photograph. Either a tech product was either launched by a man or by a woman. And you know, people said whether or not they liked it. And what they determined from that study is that women supported women, even if they weren't from that sector, and men supported men. And that's what we see on our platform. So we have a huge number of people just Googling crowdfunding women. They know there's Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and feel that those aren't necessarily the right platforms or places for them. And, and, a, and another big myth is it's not just the size of your platform or how long it's been around. It really breaks down to how you engage with your community and how you want to be associated. You, you don't really raise the money from the crowd the way people think of that as anonymous people. 80% of all campaigns on every platform, the money comes from your circle and how you engage with your circle. So it's, you know, maybe 20% unless you have a celebrity. But, you know, basically most of the money is going to come from your circle. So many of the platforms are now saying we're just a funding company. It's not really about the crowd. And second of all, reward-based, um, that's another thing that's going away because many of the companies that are put in the category of reward-based crowdfunding, it's actually many people don't even want what the rewards are. We have a huge number, like 70% of campaigns, the people contribute money and say, I don't really care about the reward. I want to see your project succeed. Or I'm going to do a pre-order of a product. And I don't think a pre-order of a product really should be considered a reward. You ordered a, a product. So the terminology is changing as the industry ev evolves. And I think it's a huge, huge opportunity, um, I think, for companies that have not been able to get that early capital. I think this is an important um, point on the whole capital chain. Great. I'm going to add one more thing to what uh, Deborah said. So the two research uh, studies that uh, Deborah was talking about, the one by NYU and Wharton, and the other was Kaufman and uh, Berkeley University, um, both found that women are actually more successful at the reward-based um, crowdfunding. So even if you control for the fact that men tend to uh, raise more money, um, and the more money you raise, the less likely you are to be successful. Even when you control for that, women are being more successful. So I want to turn it over now to um, Joanna uh, Schwartz of um, Early Shares. She's taken a look at all of the different crowdfunding platforms and categorized them. And if you can talk a little bit about what would be appealing to women as investors and women as entrepreneurs from that categoriz categorization Absolutely. that you've done. 
Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Luan. It's great to be here um, back in New York. But if you want to know the weather forecast, just ask my travel schedule because I come from Miami and every time I come, it is disaster weather here. I don't know what's been going on. Um, uh, so this is an interesting topic. I'm on panels all the time, but I don't really usually get an opportunity to just speak in, in this area. And I come to the topic um, having kind of sat in every seat. So I've been an entrepreneur and I've raised money for my own businesses, which certainly is uh, a greater big ER challenge. There's no question about that. Um, and I've been an active angel investor and most of my angel investments have actually been in women-led companies. I'm now um, a, wo a woman CEO, um, raising money for my own business and helping other companies raise, raise money. Um, what is interesting in our, our platform, um, we are, as was mentioned in the introduction, an equity-based uh, platform. Um, we are actually playing a little bit up market, not really doing the angel startup funding. Um, the companies on our platform tend to have already had funding. They're experienced entrepreneurs, um, have experience in the space, and we're kind of filling like almost like a pre-A gap. Um, and in many cases, we actually have a company right now raising a Series D financing on, on our platform. So we're a little bit more up market. I, I really agree um, with what you said, that this is really just now an extension of the of the capital chain and we also are really um, disavowing the word crowd as much as we can because it really is just a new way of syndicating a new way of gaining of giving access to a new group of investors and it's a new uh, it's really just a new aspect of distributing and and giving access to investments what what happens and we've seen on the on the side of women in particular is that if you just kind of go about your business in the natural course of business and uh, I'm a woman running my company and most of my senior management team are also happen to be very capable amazing women um, but um, less than 1% of the applications that come into our company are actually women-led entrepreneurs and less than 1% of the investors who are actually participating um, in the campaigns are actually women investors. And so it brings to mind this concept of um, I, I really um, I, I enjoy what you're saying and I appreciate what, what Terry says in terms of how to, how to um, target women, but I also think that it's really a matter of, it's a matter of custom targeting to bring them in, but then once you're in, I believe that the product is not necessarily that different because all the aspects that Terry was raising that women care about, um, I mean, there's a lot of men in the audience, I think you could agree that we care about value proposition. Men and women care about value proposition. They care about the story. They care about the testimonials. They care about clear, easy, concise, right? So to me, it's, I think when I think about how do I bridge that gap on my own platform, what are we doing? We're starting to create educational programs that are targeted to women in the sense that women wind up in the audience, right? Because we talk all the time at these panels and most of the people we're talking to happen to be men and then the men happen to be the ones who participate. So I think it's a matter of creating custom um, outreach programs so that you're reaching women and educating them on the ability of how to raise money in, the, in this new channel and then how to attract them in to become investors. And But once you're in, I don't necessarily believe the product is any different. We strive for all of those characteristics you mentioned are things that we strive for on our on our uh, platform regardless. Now, specifically towards that effort, um, what Jerry was mentioning is we, um, we have a slide that we use in a lot of our presentations where we talk about how um, all the platforms, and there are hundreds of them, as you know right now, new ones popping up every day, they really vary across many different metrics. And it's, we, our slide says seven, but they kind of, go, they kind of vary <coughs> against each other. And we came, we came to this realization because everyone kept saying, well, where do you sit in the industry, early shares, and where do you sit? And everyone's trying to really categorize everybody in these two-by-two two boxes. And it just doesn't work like that. The industry is incredibly diverse. Platforms are incredibly diverse. And so um, they vary according to the regulatory environment that they're working in. Some are doing 506C. Some are doing 506B. Some are doing rewards crowdfunding. Some are doing Reg A. So there's a big variation on how the platforms are, are engaging with the regulatory environment that's available. There's a big variety in the, the product focus. Are they focused in a niche of an industry, a specific industry? Um, are they just a real estate platform? Are they just a startup platform? Are they just a woman platform? So, or are they more diverse and varied? Um, there's the abil there's a variation according to diligence and vetting. Some platforms are open platforms and truly are technology-driven platforms. <laughs> so like the Craigslist of listings, right? Anybody can post what they want 
want to post, um, and then it, they leave it to the participants to kind of vet and select what they're interested in versus um, what you saw on the panel earlier today where those are very highly vetted and diligenced platforms and deals um, with you know less than 2% of the deals getting, getting on the platform. And then the process of diligence, the process of storytelling, um, the process of how those platforms are actually getting paid for the work they're doing. All of those variants, um, every single platform out there has made choices along these seven variants of how, about how they are going to do their business, what product, what sector, what pricing, what diligence, et cetera. And so, um, are there characteristics that work better for women? Um, I suppose to the extent that we're talking about the storytelling and the diligence, I think that all of that is very important. Um, I also think that there are characteristics just related to our everyday life, there's this access. Um, to the extent that women are often maybe left out of the normal um, networking and, and kind of the country clubbing aspect of access to capital um, activities, the fact that these platforms are available um, and you can, if you have a good enough offering, get on a platform um, without that you know, country club aspect. Um, or as an investor that you can invest in your own time um, in your own way and gain access to the information in a very transparent, seamless way without having to kind of jump through the normal hurdles of, of acquiring that information. I think all of that is very, um, is very appealing to women. But I, I personally am a little uncomfortable saying that because I think that's also appealing to men, right? I, it, it, it is. And that's just the beauty of this marketplace. And we're looking forward to engaging more women on our platform and, and starting some of that custom outreach. Um, but frankly, I don't think our product will differ very much once we do that because we're very proud of what we're offering um, and that we believe it appeals to both. So we only have a, <clears throat> a few more minutes, uh, and I want to talk about the angel side. So um, it's a huge opportunity uh, to activate uh, women. They have $11.2 uh, trillion of investable assets. That's about 40% of the overall marketplace. Um, we have different levels of angel expertise here. Um, some of the research uh, that I've been reading from the Center for Talent and Innovation, which did a report called Harnessing the Power of the Purse, um, Merrill Lynch, uh, I think even UBS and a couple of others, uh, really are saying that there's not that much difference between men and women as investors. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, once you control for education, wealth, and job status, uh, the way that we invest is pretty similar. So. Um, Deborah, you're the most experienced angel investor than Joanna and Terry. This whole conversation has got, gotten her so um, excited that she actually now wants to become an angel investor. I'm going to go through the whole panel, but very, very quickly because there's only a couple minutes left. Uh, Deborah, what got you interested and how do you think um, we can activate more women to become angel investors? So I've, I've seen some major trends in the last three years, and I think the, we're in an upward trend here. I think more and more women are interested in becoming investors. I think they're realizing they have um, economic muscle and have interests that are consistent with angel investing. So they tend to see companies that they can relate to the product. If it's a female-founded company and it's a product for the female market, women um, are beginning to say, hey, I get that. Actually, I want to invest in that. And I also want to encourage and support other women entrepreneurs. So one thing that does come up in the information about women investors, they tend to actually also have a component, which is, I want to think this is important, or I want to care about this. I want to make a return first, but second of all, I want to do something I believe in. So when they see great women entrepreneurs, it's a natural. And if you look at uh, organizations that are kind of organized angel investors like Golden Seeds, you'll see the membership rising. If you look all over the place, there are women banding together. I must get a phone call every single week from a woman who says, you know what, I'm thinking about angel investing. How do I get started? 
and you see it. You see it in the statistics. So it is, um, I think, a force to be reckoned with. I think it's a growth area. And it tends to be very satisfying for women to participate because they love to mentor the companies and see them succeed. So Joanna, you're an experienced angel investor. How did you get interested in it? And how do we activate more women to get interested? It was actually a very, a very similar, similar story. I found myself just in a, in a gap in terms of um, my uh, what I was working on, and I had some extra time, and I. Um, spend a lot of time supporting entrepreneurs, but I, I'm very involved in an organization called YPO, and I had run that organization for a few years, and actually, it's also 95% men, and, and I, I loved what I, the work I did, and we did, we did um, amazing programming, but at the end of the day, I said, you know what, I would really love to be applying a lot of this enthusiasm and energy towards women and supporting their efforts, and so um, I joined an angel group that was actually, um, has morphed into a, a larger women's angel group now, um, and uh, we just started actively um, participating and engaging in women, and, and I totally agree with what you're saying that it is that it is really a trend, and people are and women are really interested. And but so that's where it goes back to what I was saying before. It's not a, a matter so much of changing the nature of investing because women, like you said, you control for these factors. We care about the same things. We understand the same analytics. We're looking for the same things, and men also are looking to care about their investments secondarily, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really just a matter of how do you draw them? How do you draw the women? In into this ecosystem so that they're participating and then once they're participants they can participate in the same in the same way that everybody else is and that's really for me the gap that I think that we are looking to bridge here mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely something now that in my own situation that our company is is on a growth path and we're you know now it's something that we can focus on and bring into the fold and say this is a real interest area for us can I just Great. make one quick follow-up I, mean, I don't want to dominate this but the the part of the um, opportunity here with crowdfunding is that huge numbers of women are coming forward and contributing on a reward based, maybe now thinking about equity. So it is actually their first opportunity to think about, I'm giving money and it's not philanthropy. I'm giving mm -hmm. money to something that's a business that has a future. And you know what? I want to return or I want to participate more. And that I think is very exciting because not only are you going to get these female founded projects and companies, more capital, you're gonna get, we're building this base of women who are now contributing money online. And it is more than half the population. So, and, and women control the wealth in the country, believe it or not, you know, typically at a much older age when they inherit the wealth. But nevertheless, there's huge money. It's a huge, it's, it's half or more of the population and it's, growing, it's changing, there's a sea shift going on. So for all of you who have companies, don't underestimate or discount this opportunity. Okay, so uh, only a couple more minutes uh, left. So Terry, what about this conversation got you so excited uh, um, in angel investing? Well, I think they've said it all. As an entrepreneur myself, my business partner and I started Tag Creative with with no capital, and we had a really interesting relationship with our numerous banks along the way trying to uh, be able to have funding for growth. Um, you know, uh, had this sort of financing or had we been aware of it at the time, I definitely would have gone that way. And I think as a business owner, and you know, we're super proud, we've made it 14 years, we think that's an incredible uh, accomplishment. We have tried to mentor other entrepreneurs, women and men, along the way, but it's always been just like a giving advice kind of thing. And the idea that you can actually, um, back on my emotional connection, uh, make an investment that is personal to you in a way that matters to you and that has like a different kind of meaning than, to me as an individual investor, like, Investing has always seemed kind of a remote thing, and even though I may have liked what the company or corporation was doing, I didn't really connect to it. This is just a much more personal thing and a way that you can give advice, mentor, and get a return all at the same time. It's like a really win-win, I think, for everybody. We call it passionomics. Yeah. There you go, passionomics. So I want to turn it, uh, the last comment over to uh, Amanda. What can the council do to help facilitate all of this? Yeah, so I think this is, the, this is like the culture part of the conversation. Um, we spend a lot of time internally having this conversation about, you know, like the way that we're framing our research 
just making sure that women don't sound like victims of the system. And I think that this is the part where it's like we need to make sure that there are other pe the people on the other side of the table can actually receive what we are saying. So similar to what we're doing on the like bank loan front and making sure that the bank lenders can actually receive the pitches from women and you, we have this conversation around angel investors too. Obviously, we need to make sure that there are more women on the other side of that table. So this is the kind of cultural component that we are actually looking to launch a larger campaign, kind of a public awareness campaign around in 2015 to make sure that we are tackling this issue. We are doing a conversation tomorrow morning actually around the pipeline to get women into careers in finance and like this room alone is i think like a telling reality of why we need to get more women on into into this side of the business and this part this side of the table um i also want to just point out the fact that there is so much research out there that actually says that an investment into a women-led or women-owned um, business is actually a better investment, too, in the long run. One of the findings that we found in our recent high-growth research was that women, they might not have the uh, expectation of growth on the front end, which is why you run into the undercapitalization problems so, like, time and time again, because they're not asking for the money that they actually need up front, because they don't expect to grow their and scale their business in the way that they actually can, but then six months later, they're actually seeing higher growth rates than any male than the male counterparts that are running businesses. So, from an investor perspective, like this is actually a stronger move to make. And I think as we're talking about angel investing and making sure that we're getting women on this other side of the table, like obviously want to also promote the fact that women run and led businesses are actually the higher performers. And I will like, dare I say higher, but yes, um, they are the higher performers. So in terms of the like return on investment, um, it's more than just a return on an investment because it's good for that individual business. that's going to be able to grow and scale and create jobs, which is what everyone cares about. And, you know, increase their own revenues and receipts, but they're also the money that uh, women are making from their businesses are getting turned and flipped into supporting their own communities in a way that you don't see with their male counterparts. So I think big picture, like long run, just the investments that we are making into women it's a will have a tremendous ripple effect on the economy, obviously, but making sure that we get more women on that other side of the table is key to that, just because I think we all do know that, you know, you like to fund or you're interested in people and things that um, are of interest to you and that look like you and all of that great so stuff. So I'm going to wrap, but I want to make, before I do wrap, I want to make two more points. One is we didn't discuss the importance of men. Um, so <coughs> men really need to be involved. And the last point that I want to say <coughs> is that we're crowdfunding, uh, Crowdnetic and I are crowdfunding uh, the report. So if you want to get involved in that report, just see me and give me your uh, card. So thank you. Thank you. Great panel. Thank you.